Nick, thanks very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here um, and to have the chance to tell you about the work that's currently closest to my heart um, in trying to understand meiosis, and I'll say a little bit about what that is for those of you not from a biological background, um, and its connection with a number of other key parts of, of biology. So um, just to set the scene, uh, probably many of you are familiar with this, um, I'll talk initially in terms of humans, and then I'll kind of segue into studying uh, mice, which is the model organism that we've focused on. Um, so we have each of our cells has DNA. It's like the cell's instruction manual. Uh, the totality of our DNA is called our genome. In fact, we have two copies of it. We inherit one copy from our father via the sperm that uh, was involved in our conception, and one copy of our genome from our mother via the egg. Those, uh, the DNA in genomes is packaged. It's packaged into chromosomes. In humans, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, and again, we inherit one complete set of chromosome from each um, parent. And here's a, a, a kind of cartoony picture. So the nucleus of the cell has all of the DNA packaged in chromosomes. Chromosomes are very long strings of DNA. So there are 3 billion letters of DNA in an entire genome. And so a typical human chromosome is, is between the smaller ones are 60 or 70 million letters of DNA long, and the larger ones are several hundred letters of DNA long. So that's a lot of DNA. It's wrapped up on itself. It's wrapped up on particular proteins called histones. But if you did all the unwrapping, you'd eventually see the familiar uh, double-stranded, double helix of DNA. And for some of what I want to talk about, it'll be helpful for you to think of chromosomes. And for other bits, uh, it'll be useful to remember that DNA comes in this double-stranded um, package. So we have two copies of each of our chromosomes. You've each got two copies of human chromosome 5, for example. For almost everything that those chromosomes do, they can happily be blissfully unaware of the fact that there's another copy of chromosome 5. So what do chromosomes do? What does the DNA do? It, it, it for example, is involved in um, expressing genes, so in making proteins. It has both the regulatory machinery that determines when and how much that happens, um, and the instructions for assembling the amino acids that make a protein. A and when gene expression happens, you've got uh, either identical or very similar copies of a particular gene, one on your paternal copy of chromosome 5, one on the maternal copy, and they just kind of get on with it uh, and produce the protein. If one of them isn't working, that's sometimes bad news and, and a source of, of a range of human diseases. But it doesn't matter to them that there happens to be another copy of chromosome 5 somewhere else. Even when uh, cells divide in ordinary cell division, mitosis, again, the chromosomes don't need to worry about the fact that they exist in pairs. Um, so slightly complicated. So these are already double-stranded. Here's a particular human chromosome. The cell's about to divide. What the cell does is to duplicate this chromosome so you get two copies of it and all of the others. And then it just has to, it, it wants to arrange that each cell has the right number of chromosomes in it. So if you duplicate one of the copies of chromosome 5 and, and do the same with the other one, then you just need to make sure that when the cell divides, one of those duplicated copies goes into one of the two daughter cells and the other one goes into the other daughter cell. And you can do that completely independently for both copies of chromosome 5. The one time you can't do that is in meiosis. So meiosis is a specialized form of cell division that produces sperm or eggs. So as I said, effectively all of our cells have got two copies of our genome. They've got two copies of each of the chromosomes. But a, a sperm cell or an egg cell has to have exactly one copy of the genome. That's because when the sperm and the egg get together, you get an individual again um, with two copies of each chromosome. So if you think about it, and I want to encourage you to do that, you have to worry about the fact that there are two pairs of, of, of chromosome 5 because you've got to make sure that one of them goes into one of the resulting cells and the other one goes into the other resulting cell. You can't treat them independently. Uh, in fact, uh, nature does it in a slightly more complicated way. We start off with cells that have two copies of each of our chromosomes. The first thing we do is to duplicate them. So now we have cells that have four copies of each of the chromosomes. Uh, that's what's happened here. The, the, so this is a single chromosome. Uh, the green ones are the ones you got from your mum, and the purple ones are the ones you got from your dad. They each get duplicated. And then there has to be this process where the two pairs, oh, they're called homologues, the two copies of chromosome 5, find each other in the cell. And in fact, they physically uh, attach or interattach. And I'll show a bigger picture and, and some details of that in a minute. And then when they're physically attached, it helps the cell to make sure that when the division happens, well, you've got four to start with, so you have to have division. So you get two in one daughter cell, 
and two in the other daughter cell, and then you have a further round of division, and you get one of each of the longer chromosomes and one of each of the shorter chromosomes. So this is an individual with just two pairs of chromosomes. We've actually got 23. And that happens uh, at this stage. I said the chromosomes physically join. They literally do. So these are called sister chromatids. There are two um, copies of, say, the maternal chromosome 5, two copies of the paternal chromosome 5, and there's this process where they kind of get chopped up and rejoined so that what you end up with, if you look closely enough down here, this chromosome here has, uh, is in fact a mosaic. It's got a chunk of the purple uh, chromosome and then a chunk of the green one. And over here, there's its complement, which has got the small chunk of purple and the large chunk of green. And that process is called crossing over. Uh, and uh, the event of having one of these mosaics with a join here is called a recombination event. And that's absolutely central to um, my story in a number of different ways. So again, um, just to, to reiterate with a, another version, of slightly um, less dynamic version of that picture, the pairs of chromosomes come together and at a, in a certain way, and I'll come back to saying how we think this happens, um, they kind of uh, cro literally cross over here and then when they separate, this will produce four chromosomes. One will be entirely red, one will be red and then gray, one will be gray and then red, and the other one will be entirely gray. Meiosis, this, this fundamental process that produces sperm and eggs, absolutely essential to um, any species, including ours, continuing, it's very hard to study because it only occurs inside organisms. So there are many cellular processes, including ordinary cell division, that you can kind of make happen in a lab, in a petri dish or a test tube or a cell culture um, uh, facility and so on, and you can actually watch it happening. There aren't yet any cellular models for meiosis. So the only thing you can do is kind of see what happens beforehand, see what happens afterwards, or you can look at cells when they're in the middle of meiosis, but to do that, you kind of kill the cell, so you can't see what happens next. So these are those sorts of pictures, chromosomal spreads. And actually, if we start from the, this is early on in the first part of meiosis. If we start from the right, um, each of these uh, long straggly things, these are now, this is now in mice, um, are a pair of homologous, so uh, similar chromosomes joined up. And the way we can visualize this under a microscope is that we add certain stains which detect the presence of proteins that, that are involved in different ways. So these are kind of orangey colored. I'll, uh, you'll see where that comes from in a minute. And they show each one of these things. You can count them. There are 19 of them. Uh, mice have 19 pairs of chromosomes, um, is one of those paired chromosomes. If you look closely, there's something slightly odd here. There's a little uh, green bit here and a larger green bit here. And they're only joined at one end. They're the sex chromosomes. Um, so this is a male meiosis. Uh, the male has a Y chromosome and an X chromosome. And they pair just at one end. There's a separate and really interesting story about that, which I, uh, well, we in the field are learning more about, but I won't go into um, tonight. So this is kind of after the joining up has happened. If you go backwards in time, this is uh, a stage called zygotine, uh, partway through the joining up. So some of these have started joining. And this is early on. In looking at these pictures, you have to remember that what's going on is going on in three-dimensional space. The other thing that's a complication, and I don't want you to worry about too much, is that uh, although we draw pictures of entire chromosomes lining up, it's not actually like that. The DNA in the chromosomes is kind of floating around in loops, and then there are bits of it uh, which join with the, the DNA from the homologue. Um, so this is early on, and these green blobs, uh, what, what the chromosomes do is they first, each chromosome separately makes what's called an axis, and then those axes come together. So the early stage is when those axes are just starting to be made. So it doesn't look like it here, but there are, there are 19 pairs of chromosomes there. So this blob, this blob, this blob, this one, and maybe even that one are all part of the same chromosome. But because it's, it's really in three-dimensional space, and then you've projected it, um, they don't look as joined up. As the process continues, the axes uh, enlarge. So you can now see entire chromosomes. And some of these, you can see they've started to come together. And then that finishes, or this part of the process finishes at what's called packetine, with all the chromosomes paired up. And that's a really crucial part of the story, that, that process that ends with chromosomes being paired up. So recombination, this process of, of um, swapping a bit of one chromosome for a bit of the other, um, is absolutely essential, um, both 
in a very mechanistic way, but also um, in an evolutionary framework. It's essential in a mechanistic way because it's this, so here's, this is a bit more interesting, here's a pair of chromosomes that have two of these recombination events occurring in the same meiosis. That happens, it's not that common, but it happens. Um, it's essential in a mechanistic way because it's that physical join that helps the cell ensure that when it does the division, it ends up with the right number of chromosomes uh, in each of the daughter cells. So it's absolutely uh, essential in a kind of physical way. To give you a sense, so in mammals, you have to have um, one crossover per chromosome. Uh, in the shorter chromosomes in mammals, typically you have exactly one. In the larger ones, you can uh, occasionally have more than one. There are interesting questions um, about where they happen when there are more than one, and there's uh, both theory and data on that. And to give you a sense, uh, in humans, well, first of all, the total number of recombinations differ between males and females. Uh, in a female meiosis, so the production of an egg, there are typically about 40 recombination events. In males, there are about 28. The other thing that's really important about um, recombination is its role in evolution. What it does, this, what this process does, is to shuffle up bits of genome. So there's genetic variation in almost any natural population. There's genetic vari variation amongst all of us in the room. And that variation arises because of mutations. It arises because of events where when um, a sperm or an egg is being produced, when the copying of DNA happens, there's not an exact copy at a particular position, so one letter gets miscopied. Instead of the T being there, there might be a C. So that generates genetic variation. If no recombination happened, uh, so we'd have entire chromosomes passed on from generation to generation, and, and there are lots of evolutionary reasons why that would be a bad thing. So in, in a couple of different ways, if, if a good variant arose on one chromosome in the population and another good variant arose on another chromosome, it would be bad for evolution if you could never get them together. Uh, this process allows that to happen. And similarly, if bad things arise, you can kind of swap them off and they don't drag the good things away with them. And there's lots of very elegant um, evolutionary theory and mathematical modeling about how that process happens. But I just want to make the point that recombination is absolutely central to shaping the patterns of variation we see in natural populations on which all of evolution and natural selection depends. I said it's also essential for making sure you get the right number of, of chromosomes in a sperm or an egg. When that doesn't occur, it's called aneuploidy. So uh, cells are aneuploid if they don't have exactly one of each chromosome. Um, well, cells are aneuploid if they don't have two of each chromosome, and, and you have a problem if the sperm or egg doesn't have exactly one. And it's not infrequent. In um, female meioses, it's estimated that between 50 and 15 and 60% of oocytes, of eggs, um, or precursors to eggs produced by a woman have these problems. The number's much lower in sperm. It, 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 not all of that's well understood. Uh, it's not because somehow, in this respect, maybe uniquely, males are somehow more efficient than females. Um, it, it's because, in, and it's a key part of the story I'll come back to, in male meiosis, there are lots of checkpoints. So the cell does a lot of stuff in males during meiosis to check that everything's working fine. And if it looks like it's not working, it kind of throws that cell away. And so the sperm that get through those checkpoints uh, tend to be um, much better in terms of, of avoiding these problems than uh, oocytes do. The reasons for this aren't well understood, and there can be effects with age. So oocytes in eggs produced by older women uh, typically have more of these aneuploidies than eggs produced by um, younger women. So what happens when uh, either the sperm or the egg, more commonly the egg, has the wrong number of chromosomes? The most common outcome is that the resulting fetus won't be viable, and that pregnancy will be lost, often very early on, and often before the woman would even know they were pregnant. But uh, lots of uh, pregnancy loss in the first trimester, for example, can be due to this kind of thing. And, and almost all of these problems of having the wrong number of chromosomes result in a fetus that isn't viable, so it, it never carries to full term. There are a small number of exceptions, and the most common one um, is when you have three copies of chromosome 21, uh, formerly called trisomy 21, informally often known as, at least in English, as Down syndrome. So individuals with three copies of chromosome 21 are viable, um, but there are a number of aspects in which uh, they're different from uh, individuals who have two copies of chromosome 21. So apart from recombination's key role in, in evolution, 
It's absolutely vital, and, and in fact, problems with this are still the leading cause of pregnancy loss and, and of intellectual disability. There's a separate part of the story. There are other processes that happen in the formation of sperm or egg which are related to recombination, which have the consequence that in some large chunk of DNA, think of, of tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions of, of bases, get duplicated. So instead of having two copies of that bit of DNA, it's as if one of them has been cut out uh, on one of the chromosomes or sometimes duplicated it. So you might end up with not of a whole chromosome, but of a large chunk of DNA, you might end up with other than two copies. And that sometimes has health consequences as well. It's a different story, and I won't go into the details, but just to flag, it's not unrelated to this. So I want to come back. In, in telling the story, I said at a certain po point in meiosis, uh, the pair of copies of chromosome 5 find each other and kind of line up next to each other. And that's the way we tell the story when we're teaching meiosis. Just think a little bit about what's going on here. Cell nucleus is a pretty crowded place. There's lots of stuff. It's probably fairly chaotic. Chromosomes are very, very long, tightly coiled bits of DNA. They don't have flags on them saying, I'm chromosome 5, uh, and can somehow look for another chromosome which has also got a chromosome 5 flag. How on earth do these long, coiled up bits of DNA in the cell nucleus actually, first of all, identify the, the other chromosome they're supposed to pair with? And secondly, having identified with it, how do they manage to lie up, line up in the right way? They might actually, and we probably do think they do that in the other order, they, they match up a little bit, um, and then from that manage to line the whole thing up. And just to give you a sense, so here's an analogy. Um, so the distance from, I'm reliably informed, from Vienna to Oxford, which is where I'm based, is about 1,300 kilometers. So if you took a, a typical chromosome and stretched it out, or if you took the whole genome and stretched it out, and you imagine, and You'll see in a moment why it's the right thing to be thinking of. If you imagine just taking a 1,000 base pairs, a small bit of DNA, and just asking whereabouts in the whole genome was the other copy of that, it's, uh, if you're just looking on a, an average-sized chromosome, it's like looking for a double-decker bus uh, somewhere between Vienna and Oxford. And if you're looking across the whole genome, it's like finding a hat somewhere between Vienna and Oxford. So how on earth does a cell do this? Uh, you know, it can't kind of start at one end and First of all, you don't know where the ends are, but it can't start and kind of progressively search. Well, at least it probably can't do that. If you do simple calculations, it would just take way too long. So I mean, there are many mysteries of, of human biology. One of the key mysteries for me, uh, and, and one of the things that drives a lot of the work we do, is to try and understand how this process works and the sorts of things that, that affect it. So that's, that's one part of the story, and, and it turns out that that process of finding your pair is key to, to two other bits of the story I'm going to tell you about. So the first is, if you look at recombination, so I said females tend to have more, female ma humans tend to have more recombination events than male humans. That's true. If you look along a particular chromosome, then recombination events happen a bit more in some places than others. So example, in, in human males, recombinations happen much more near the ends of chromosomes than they do in other places. That's not true for human females. Uh, so we've, we've known for a long time, both in humans and in other organisms, that over very large scales on chromosomes, recombination rates varied. It wasn't as if you were picking somewhere uniformly at random. What became clear more recently, and I used to say quite recently, but I've been doing this for a while, so 16 or 17 years ago, um, Alec Jeffries in Leicester in the UK did some really, really clever experiments where he was able to identify individual recombination events uh, in sperm. And what he saw, much to his and everybody else's surprise, was that instead of being spread randomly, so this is a picture from his um, seminal paper looking at about 250 um, kilobases, 250,000 base pairs as it happens in the human uh, MHC, for those of you familiar with that, but it's not relevant to the story. When he looked in that region, instead of seeing the recombination events happening everywhere, they all clustered into six small positions, which uh, those positions have subsequently been called recombination hotspots. So here's the picture you, you want to have. There are things, and we don't understand them very well, which determine where recombination happens over very large scales in genomes. But if you're able to zoom in, and that's all we used to be able to see from looking at patterns of recombination in pedigrees. If you're able to kind of zoom in and look at smaller scales, it's not this kind of smooth variation you see at large scales. It's very, very peaky. 
And a lot of work that's happened over the last 10 or 15 years is to understand what drives this. I, uh, why do they happen in those specific positions and not somewhere else? Uh, and actually, there's a bigger question, which I'll come back to at the end of the talk. Why do they happen in specific positions? Do they have to happen in specific positions? Or is it just that that's the way the machinery works? So I'll kind of in one slide tell you about 10 years of our work. And it was, uh, I said previously, Alec Jeffries had done these really nice experiments looking at um, individual sperm. But they're quite um, intricate experimentally. And people had used them to look at a small number of specific regions in the genome. And well, at least at the time, uh, we developed a different approach. There were maybe about 10 of these examples across the whole human genome known. Now, remember I said that uh, recombination is a key factor in shaping patterns of genetic variation in natural populations. So it turns out, um, and I won't go into the details, it turns out that if you have the patterns of natural variation in um, a population and you use somewhat clever statistical methods, you can infer where recombination events happen. So I'll be slightly technical just for a sentence or two. Um, we know in humans and many other organisms that variation is correlated over short scales, so-called linkage, what population geneticists call linkage disequilibrium. And then uh, people had observed that if you look in humans, that linkage disequilibrium persists for a while, and then it tends to drop off. And then there's, there are new patterns of linkage disequilibrium. So that dropping off, we now know, is caused by recombination events. Uh, well, we probably always thought that. But the fact that it drops off is that because there's a recombination hotspot there. So at a high level, we developed computation-intensive statistical methods that took genomic scale data in humans as it became available from about 2003 onwards and estimated positions of these recombination hotspots. Um, and although we couldn't estimate them quite as well as, as the wonderful experiments were able to do, uh, we identified over 30,000 hotspots across the human genome through this approach. And this is just a picture of a human chromosome 11. So each one of these peaks is one of the hotspots. You can't see very well, um, but if you peer, and I'll try and trace it out, there's a kind of red line at the bottom that goes roughly like this. So that's what was known about recombination events from all of the pedigree-based approaches. And you can think about our statistical methods as really allowing us to zoom in and see this peakiness. We had uh, so many instances of recombination hotspots. We did this in humans because it was in humans that the data was uh, most abundant. Um, for, for reasons to do with disease studies, there were growing amounts of data on genetic variation across the human genome. We had enough uh, recombination hotspots um, that we were actually able to identify a sequence motif, a string of letters in the DNA, well, several of them if you're used to these uh, pictures, uh, in the DNA that were associated with hotspots. So it's, it's not quite, uh, it's slightly more complicated than this, but, but informally, if in humans, and it turns out in Caucasian humans, um, the DNA sequence CCT, CCCT, uh, anything, anything, CCAC, if you have that sequence, you might well be a recombination hotspot. And it was kind of interesting because, um, as is the case in biology, people study uh, recombination in many different uh, organisms and species. And many organisms are easier because you can manipulate them than humans, yeast being a natural model system for people interested in recombination. Um, and in spite of all the work that had been done in yeast, this was the first species uh, in which a sequence motif had been identified um, and associated with recombination. And actually, we now know there isn't one in yeast for reasons um, that we also understand. It happens to be the case um, that this motif marks positions where these big events, um, millions of base pairs of DNA, also get copied or deleted uh, in those non-allelic homologous recombination genomic disorders I was talking about. <clears throat> so having identified the uh, sequence motif, uh, we and others were keen to find out what was the molecular machinery that was making recombination happen at those positions. And in parallel with two other groups, um, in our case almost entirely through kind of computational approaches, we identified uh, the protein involved. It's a protein called PRDM9, which is absolutely central to the rest of my story. Um, so you have to remember that, PRDM9, but you'll hear it so many times it'll be hard not to remember it, at least until later this evening. Um, it has various domains uh, in the protein, but at one end is this thing called a zinc finger array. So zinc fingers are bits of proteins, so named because, well, they're kind of shaped a bit like fingers, and they actually bind to specific bits of DNA. And each finger binds to a certain part, and so if you have a sequence of fingers, that determines uh, a sequence in the DNA that the protein binds to. <clears throat> 
And we now know um, that in humans, there's this, and a number of other species, there's this protein, PIDM9. It has a particular configuration of link fingers, and that causes it to bind at DNA, which has that motif, CCT, CCCT, and then CCAC. Um, that's why recombination hotspots happen at those positions. It's because these zinc, zinc fingers are kind of tuned to recognize and bind to that motif in DNA. So we were pretty excited. Uh, our work was mainly based on humans, and the two other groups studied mice. Um, uh, we were pretty excited to have this piece of the puzzle about why recombination happened, hotspots happened where they happened. But interestingly, actually, lots of species don't have PIDM9. Uh, more don't have it than do have it. Um, most mammals have PIDM9, but actually dogs don't. Uh, dogs and wolves and the, that family don't have PIDM9. Um, and recently, uh, there was an observation of a human, a woman, who didn't have PIDM9, and um, she's got kids, so for her, meiosis worked fine as well. And they are interesting questions. It's a longer part of the story, and we have hypotheses about what's going on there. So here's a cartoon uh, which tells you some of what we know about how the process works. So here's uh, one of the homologous chromosomes, and it's got the letters in it that PIDM9 likes. So the zinc finger part of, DNA, uh, of PIDM9 binds to those letters. It physically attaches to the DNA. There are other bits of, of PIDM9 which then put down a chemical mark. Uh, for those of you who know what this means, a histone mark and a particular histone mark, H3K4ME3. Um, so that's what these little balloons are. They're the marks on the DNA. And, and then there's some other molecular machinery that subsequently comes along and cuts the DNA, both strands. So this, this is just one chromosome now. It's got you know, the double-stranded thing. So this is uh, one strand and the other strand. So this other protein called SPO11 comes along and makes a cut. And there are lots of pieces between PRBM9 binding and SPO11 cutting uh, that we don't yet fully understand. But some of the pieces in that puzzle are becoming a little bit clearer. The next thing that happens after SPO11 does its cut is um, what's called end resection. So there's a cut here, and there would be normally blunt ends of the two strands of DNA. Other stuff comes along and eats back uh, one of the two strands, um, the same strand in each case, uh, leaving a single strand hanging uh, kind of by itself at one end. And then there's another protein, there are actually several, but there's another protein uh, called DMC1, which comes along and coats those single strands. And it's another uh, important part of the story. So I'll just mention as an aside here, our cells spend a heck of a lot of their time coping with the consequences of DNA breaking, because in general it's a bad thing. So we've got massive repair machinery uh, to try and repair double strand breaks in DNA. Interestingly, the whole recombination process starts by the cell itself making these double strand breaks. And again, to give you a sense of scale, these are another set of, of um, pictures from actual meiotic cells. In terms of numbers, so in a mouse meiosis, there are about 300 of these double strand breaks that happen early in meiosis. Uh, I haven't counted the dots, but uh, if, if you got it at the right stage, there would be 300 of them. So how do you think about these pictures? Again, there's kind of DNA everywhere. Uh, it's in three dimensions and it's been squished down. The blue stuff, uh, the kind of dark blue, dappy, um, is, is illustrating where the DNA is after it's been squashed. So it's kind of every, almost everywhere in the field. These red uh, positions are places where there is, uh, where there has been a double strand break and there's this protein DMC1 coating single stranded DNA. Um, and the green thing is, is the thing it was before. It's that part uh, of the, um, it's the protein that helps make the axes on the individual chromosomes before they pair up. And you can see a number of things here. So lots of double strand breaks. Um, and then as you move through these various stages, and you can tell you're moving through stages because now the chromosomes are looking much more joined up, uh, the number of double strand breaks decrease. And actually, having created the double strand breaks for reasons that I'll explain in a minute, uh, the cell at some stage needs to sort them all out and repair them, and it does that. So here's a model uh, that um, some bits of which we know are true and others uh, are our assumptions about what's going on. So you start with um, the DNA on one of the chromosomes, which gets cut at this position. Here's its pair. I mean, it's shown right next to it for convenience, but it's actually somewhere else in the cell nucleus that it needs to line up with 
it's thought that what happens is that this, this single strand of bit of DNA kind of sticks itself inside the double helix. And DNA has a good way of working out whether things match, because when they do match, complementary base pairing happens. Uh, A's and T's uh, join with a bond, and C's and T's join with a bond. So what's th thought to be the case is that the single stranded bit of DNA invades the double helix and kind of uses this base pairing to check whether it matches. When it does match, it's found the right place. It's not only found its partner, but it's found the right place on the partner. Um, and then the cell does some extra work. It has to kind of fill in these bits, which it does by copying across from the chromosome, which hasn't been cut. It's then got this kind of intertwined thing going on, um, and it resolves that by making some more cuts here and here. And when you kind of straighten things out, you end up with the mosaic we saw, um, which has got the purple chromosome on one end, and then green, and then green, and then purple. You notice there's a bit in the middle, which is both green and purple. Don't worry about that for now. First of all, we don't understand all of it. It's for those of you who know the technical stuff. Um, there may be heteroplasmy in here, and it gets repaired uh, in ways, and possibly with biases we don't fully understand. So the current model is that there's about a, so these single-stranded ends are about 1,000 base pairs long. They kind of insert themselves in the other DNA uh, strand and find their partner. So uh, let me tell you one more piece of the puzzle. Um, turns out to be important. So people had done theoretical work, and they'd said, imagine that you've got, uh, so most of our chromosomes in any position are identical, but there are occasional differences. Um, imagine you have a position where a change occurs in the middle of this sequence, CCT, CCC, T, C, et cetera, um, that changes the sequence, so PIDM9 doesn't like binding there anymore. So this was theoretical, but we now know it to be true. They said, if, if if you've got two chromosomes, PRDM9 doesn't like binding on this one, but it still likes binding here, then what will tend to happen is that it will bind here, and that bit of DNA will get cut. And when it's cut, the stuff I've just described happen happens. There's the end resection, there's the invasion, and then there's the repair. And what happens is that the bit that gets cut, which is a good PRDM9 binding site, gets repaired by copying from the bit where there's a mutation, which is a bad PRDM9 binding site with the consequence that both of the chromosomes, if this is uh, in males, that end up in sperm, um, now have copies of this, but not this. So almost everywhere in our genome, whether this uh, bit of DNA that you got from your father or this bit you got from your mother gets passed on to your offspring is 50-50. What's happening here is the bit of DNA, the change which causes PIDM9 to stop binding as well, is more likely to get passed on to offspring. So that was all theoretical. Um, Alex Jeffries actually looked at one of these, as it happens, one of those places he looked at in detail had such a change. Um, so there was a mutation which disrupted the CC, CCT, CCCT. Um, and he actually showed that when recombination events happen, um, the, the chromosome or the bit of DNA from the chromosome um, which stopped PRDM9 from, we didn't know about PRDM9 then, but the bit of uh, DNA from the chromosome um, which degraded binding gets passed on 70 or 80% of the time. So what does that mean in an evolutionary sense? It means that if a mutation arises which makes uh, binding harder for PRDM9, it'll tend to spread through the population. So the so-called hotspot paradox was the observation that if you have these, um, if you have these positions across the genome where PRDM9 likes binding, this effect will mean they get eroded, they start going away. So the first thing to say is this effect is real. So Jeffrey saw it in one example. Actually, remember that motif, CC, which we call the Myers motif after Simon Myers who discovered it, CCT, CCCT. If you compare the human genome and the chimpanzee genome, that string of seven letters is much less frequent in the human genome than the chimpanzee genome. It, this effect actually shapes genomes. Um, and Simon and his team have done some really nice work, for example, to work out what the uh, binding motif for PRDM9 was in Neanderthals um, by looking for bits of small motifs that are missing from the ne Neanderthal genome, for example. It, it's a big enough effect that it shapes genomes, and that's an important part of the story. So how does the system cope? We don't really know, um, but there's an observation that actually the zinc finger part of PRDM9, the bit that determines what DNA sequence uh, it binds to, is extremely variable between species. In fact, it's one of the most variable bits of DNA within a gene between a bunch of species. So you can imagine what's going on is that 
you have a version of the PRDN9 allele. Its good binding sites get eroded because of this process. And then PRDM9 changes to something else. And it, because of the structure of the, um, the coding sequence here is what's called a mini satellite, if that's something you're familiar with. Um, mutations aren't single base pair changes. They're duplications or changes in numbers of repeats. That totally changes the zinc fingers. So when PRDM9 evolves, it doesn't just go from CCT, CCCT to CCT, A, CCT or something. It goes to a completely different uh, motif. And you can imagine with this hotspot erosion, that's quite helpful because you've eroded all of your good hotspots um, and then you change the whole new set. Okay, so I want to move on um, rather more quickly to the next part of the story. So speciation, which was the third thing in my title, is something biologists have been interested in at least since Darwin. What do we mean by two species? Well, it varies a bit, and, uh, but to think of it for now as saying that two groups of organisms are distinct species if their offspring aren't fertile. And there's been a huge amount of interest in trying to understand the molecular basis for that infertility. What is it that, what's going on mechanistically that stops um, these two species from interbreeding? There's a kind of standard model. Um, you can look at the picture if I want to, but it's probably easier to think of um, in the following way. Imagine that within the organism, there are two genes which have to interact. They're proteins that may actually fit together. So there's an analogy of a lock and a key. These two proteins fit together. And we have these two groups of organisms. They get separated. In one group, they, you know, from time to time, because of evolution, the lock will change a bit. Well, the key has to change, so it still fits the lock. Otherwise, the organism is not working properly, and so on. So in this group of organisms, the lock will change, the key will change, but they always change in sync. And over here, the lock changes and the key changes, always in sync. But then if you took these organisms and let them breed now, if you take the lock from one species and the key from the other, they won't fit anymore. And that's uh, a model uh, due to Dobzhansky and Muller for how these incompatibilities arise between hybrids. There aren't, uh, so I said people have been looking hard to try and find the genetic basis of, of speciation. Um, in, there's one example which is understood uh, in all of mammals, and it's to do with mice. So there are two subspecies of the house mice, um, Mus musculus domesticus and Mus musculus musculus. They have a hybrid zone across Europe, actually not so far from here, um, and scarily, rather like the Iron Curtain, but I think those two things aren't uh, related. Um, so it turns out that if you take uh, a female mouse um, from this subspecies and a male mouse from the other subspecies, their offspring are sterile. So that's exactly what um, we would talk about with species, uh, sterile offspring. It happens if you do the, other, the cross the other way around. This is a curiosity. I think we understand some of this, but I don't want you to worry about it. Um, if you do the cross the other way around, if it's a female from this side and a male from that side, then their male offspring are slightly fertile. What happens in that infertility? What happens, and these are these uh, pictures again. This is when it all works. What happens is that the chromosomes fail to pair up. That's the key thing. Um, we don't, I'm going to tell you about why, because we've worked that out, but we didn't know why. And it had been shown, again, it's slightly more complicated than this, um, but PRDM9 had been identified as A or the key gene driving this. So across all organisms, there may be 20 or so examples of genes responsible for speciation. There's only one in mammals. In fact, this was the first example in all of vertebrates, and it's my favorite gene, PRDM9. So we and others were intrigued. So it's defining where recombination events happen um, and is somehow involved in speciation. We wanted to study that. What did we do? What we did was genetic engineering. We took a version of PRDM9 in the mouse and just swapped out its zinc finger array for the one that we have in humans. Remember I said these arrays are very different. Um, so we would have expected, and indeed we did the experiments to check, that the mice with the human version of the allele, well, the first thing is that they were fertile. So there are lots of bits of, of human genes that if you just plug them into a mouse gene, you wouldn't get a viable mouse. That was kind of interesting, and there was some suspense, but it was fine. And then when we checked, it turns out that the recombination events, as we would have expected, uh, when this uh, version of PRDM9 is present, happen at completely different places in the mouse. So not only were, they, uh, were those mice fertile, 
But when we redid, remember the uh, experiment, if you take a female PWD and a male black six, their male offspring are infertile. When you just make the change that in the black six, it's carrying the human version of PRDM9 instead of its own version, the male offspring are now perfectly fertile. So just changing the zinc finger array of PRDM9 uh, by putting in the human zinc finger array had solved the problem. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how it solved the problem, but just to mention in passing, you can't believe the lock and key story uh, about this because in that analogy, what we've done is to take a lock from humans, which is separated by many millions of years of evolution from a mouse, we've put it into the mouse and we've solved the problem the mouse has, you, we would have expected to create the problem if there were in, these incompatibilities. There are ways we can, I won't go into the details, as I said, you have to study meiosis rather indirectly, but there are ways we can learn both about where the recombination events happen and about uh, which PRDM9 allele is responsible for them. So when you do that, um, it, it, this is the cross that results in infertility. You've got a PWD mother and a black six father. We know where the recombination events happen in where the hotspots are in PWD. We know where they are in black six. They're in different positions because they've got different PRDM9 alleles. Um, what we observed initially very surprisingly was that when you look in the hybrid, so the hybrid's got uh, this mother and this father, it'll have one chromosome which is kind of yellowy in my coloring and one which is blue. What we saw is that on the PWD chromosome, the one it gets from its PWD parents, the hotspots, recombination events happened at places determined by the black six PRDM9, not by the, PW, the PRDM9 that is normally in this species. And conversely, on the black six chromosome, recombination events happened at places determined by the PWD chromosome, uh, PWD PRDM9. That's actually to do with this evolutionary erosion. So I'm going to show you a cartoon. Imagine the common ancestry of these two subspecies. It will have had both lots of binding sites present. I mean, they weren't binding sites in those days because there was some other PRDM9 allele, but they were just letters in the genome. But then uh, if you go down this side, if you look at what happens as, PRD, as PWD evolved, this erosion happened. So binding sites, which are really good binding sites for PWD, will start to get lost from the PWD genome. And after some period of time, the really good ones will have gone. But any binding site which was a good binding site for black 6 PRDM9 will still be there because black 6 PRDM9 hasn't been causing this erosion in this lineage. Conversely here, the really good binding sites for black 6 PRDM9 will have gone because of the evolutionary erosion, but those for PWD will still be there. So in the hybrid, this genome's lost its really good PWD binding sites, but the really good black 6 binding sites are still there, so PRDM9 binds to them, black 6 PRDM9, and conversely here. And it turns out, to, to cut a long story short, which I need to do anyway, um, what you observe here deliberately is that PRDM9 binds at this place on one of the two chromosomes that need to pair. It's not binding at the same place on the other chromosome. So we talk about asymmetric bound, binding. It's binding on one or the other, but not both at the same time. And that turns out to be what causes all the problems. Um, when you put the human allele in, so the human allele hasn't evolved in the mouse. It'll have binding sites. They won't have been eroded. So they'll be equally present in PWD and black 6 And so at those positions, the human allele will bind equally well on both chromosomes. And suddenly, you've got positions where, where PRDM9 is binding at the same position on both chromosomes. And it turns out that's what makes the difference. So what do we, what do we know in terms of the details? There's a much longer version of this story. So we're, there are many lines of evidence. Uh, I've just shown you that we make a change, it has certain properties, and we rescue um, infertility, and I've asked you to believe that that's because of those properties. It is, and there's a lot of background I could go into, but I won't. So at a, the position of an individual hotspot, um, if it, PRDM9 binds on one of the chromosomes but not the pair at that position, it takes longer to repair. We've got direct data on that. Um, if you look at a chromosome, which has lots of these positions where PRDM9 is binding asymmetrically, it takes longer for that chromosome to find its, its partner. And then uh, in male meiosis, as I said, there are these checkpoints to make sure things are working well. So if, stuff, if it's taking longer to find your partner, at the time the checkpoint comes in to make sure everything's okay, there's a chance it won't be okay, and it says, okay, to be safe, I'll kill that cell. It doesn't actually just kill that cell, it kills a lot of other cells. And so if you have enough of this, it stops the production of minimal numbers of viable sperm. 
So it's entirely driven by the symmetry or asymmetry of PRDM9 binding. We did the experiment uh, I've just described in two substrains of the house mouse. There's another species of mice called Spreadus. Uh, it's separated, so the two, uh, the three subspecies of, of um, musculus are separated by, well, 75,000 years, so 150,000 years in total. This is more like uh, 3,500 years in total. We tried the same experiment. We said, uh, so a Spreadus mouse, which is one of these guys, and Black Six, um, which is uh, Domesticus, um, yeah, or Musculus, one of the two, is um, they don't interbreed in the wild. In fact, although their ranges overlap, which isn't true for the ones I showed you before, there are no recorded um, instances of hybrids surviving. So what we did, there's the same infertility, what we did was to change Black Six again and try and do the breeding, and to cut a long story short, in this much more distant species, it also rescued fertility. Now, I'll slightly qualify that. Um, when, when you change PRDM9, uh, the resulting male uh, hybrid does produce some sperm. So that's a huge change. It previously didn't produce any sperm. The sperm are actually a bit wonky. So if you leave these mice to breed, which we did for a while, it doesn't happen. If you do the kind of mouse equivalent of IVF, and you take one of these sperm, um, and you fertilize an egg, the resulting mouse is viable. So again, uh, at least in part, it's the same mechanism. So let me just summarize uh, where I've got to. PRDM9 is the only known speciation gene. It causes hybrid uh, sterility. That happens, we now know, because in these hybrids, there's this evolutionary erosion. I love the fact that there's a kind of evolutionary part of the story. There's evolutionary erosion, which causes it to bind in different positions on the two homologs. And it's that not binding at the same place that, that is important. I could uh, go on at some length about why it matters. Um, we always think about PRDM9 binding and a cut happening on this chromosome. It turns out that PRDM9 also needs to bind at the other position. It won't get cut, but there's stuff that then happens in meiosis, and we understand a bit of this, um, that makes it easier to find the pair, and there are models in which that may even directly involve PRDM9. I won't go into the details. In terms of speciation, as I've said, the mechanism driving this isn't the standard theory for evolution. It's not uh, Dobzhansky-Muller incompatibilities. Um, there's a sort of incompatibility. PRDM9 actually creates incompatibilities in its own genome. If PRDM9 is the lock or the key, and the genome is the lock, it's kind of wearing out the places it likes working, uh, or the, the erosion is happening. Now, as I said, PRDM9 evolves substantially and rapidly. We put in a different version of the zinc finger array, and it solved the infertility problem. But in the wild mice, PRDM9 will eventually evolve, and it'll evolve to something that has completely different binding sites, and that will restore fertility. So uh, having said earlier that we're excited, you know, every, the field was excited because we'd identified a speciation gene, actually, PRDM9's effect on speciation is only transient. It'll eventually evolve in one or other subspecies, and the effect will go away. So what might be going on here is that there's a period of time where PRDM9 is causing this hybrid infertility, where the mummy and the daddy mice have a baby boy. They put a lot of their resources into bringing up the baby boy, and then it's infertile. That's a really bad evolutionary strategy. So if some other genetic effect comes along, which either stops them from mating, that would be the best thing, or, for example, causes that um, offspring that's destined to be infertile uh, to die before it's born, that has a massive selective advantage because it's stopping the parents wasting their energy uh, raising infertile baby boys. So what PRDM9 does, we think, is to create a period of time in which there's a massive selective advantage for something else which arises which actually locks in the speciation. So that by the time PRDM9 has evolved, which it will, the symmetry stuff will have not be a problem anymore, but there'll be something else in place which causes that. Now, in the specific example I looked at, PRDM9 asymmetry is such as to completely mess up meiosis. It stops pairing, and then the checkpoints mean that it stops production of viable sperm. Um, in other settings, it may not completely stop it, but it may make meiosis less efficient. So that means that the hybrid offspring will be slightly less fertile, and that might matter over evolutionary timescales. So actually, we could imagine that PRDM9 will have an effect much, much more widely. So I'll stop. Um, just many of the details here are in a paper we published um, last year. 
We've done a lot of work subsequently that I haven't got time to talk about, actually in, in my group looking at individual sperm um, and sequencing them to learn about the consequences on recombination of, of uh, symmetry and asymmetry in hotspots. Uh, all of the work I've described is joint with my colleague uh, Simon Myers, who, with whom I've been lucky enough to work on this area for 15 years or so now. Um, the acknowledgements are all in the authorship of the paper, but there are the details. Thank you very much.